This week's Torah reading is Parshas Yisro, and it famously contains within it the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. And the topic tonight, and we'll get into it in a moment where why what what the sources are, is what it means to be a wholehearted person. So I just wanted to begin by just defining the terms a little bit. Um, being wholehearted, if someone were to say, thank you very much for your gift. So I think oftentimes we have a sense that is the person being wholehearted in their appreciation or not? And sometimes if we're really a little nervous, we sort of look at the person, are you really happy with the gift? Is this really something you liked? Is this something you really wanted? Um, you know, we wonder about those things. So um, that, that would cause inner conflict. So it's not necessarily that the person is not is 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 not being not meaning to be wholehearted, but it, it the idea being that a person just feels a sense of conflict, and therefore a sense that um, I I don't you know thank you thank you very much I appreciate you doing it and you know which leaves us feeling lousy. So we all agree that when someone does anything wholeheartedly, gives a gift, expresses appreciation. Um, helps you and you feel that the person's helping you for your own sake and therefore the person's doing it wholeheartedly as opposed to a person who might just be trying to curry favor from you and just get something out of you in the end, you know? Um, all those issues, we have an awareness of that. In the back of our minds, we think about that. And we can think about being wholehearted in two ways. One is the person could just be a phony and just be really trying to misrepresent themselves. And the other is, like I said, the person has an inner conflict or something's holding the person back and therefore they're not able to do this so wholeheartedly as you might they, they might like. The Parsha begins and it's named for Yitro, who is the father-in-law of Moshe, because in the, in the Parsha, Yitro comes to join the Jewish people after this exodus from Egypt, after the splitting of the sea, and significantly also after Amalek attacks the Jewish people and, uh, you know, and, and, and in a certain sense um, throws cold water, so to speak, on the esteem with which the, the Jewish people are held in the world. And the analogy given by the rabbis is that there was a fear, a, a, an awestruck sense that, wow, the Jewish people really are chosen by God. And Amole sought simply to dent that perception and cool down. And that's actually one of the interpretations of the word korcha baderach, that, that he cooled you off. His only intention was, oh, people think the Jewish people are so great. I'm going to do everything in my power, even at my personal expense, to bring the Jewish people down a peg or two and take that sheen or that aura of invincibility off of them. Um, and that's my only goal. So seeing all this, Yitro becomes moved to take Moshe's wife and children, join the Jewish people, and not just re to reconnect Moshe and his wife, but really to join the Jewish people. He becomes inspired. He joins the Jewish people. From that, we go on to the Jewish people camping, camping at the foot of Mount Sinai. We have the story of the days of preparation for Matan Torah, for the revelation of Sinai. It's described for us in the Parsha, and we have the Ten Commandments. What we know as the Aserah that brought the Ten Commandments listed in, the, in this week's Parsha. One of the discussions that you'll see commonly is, why would the Torah choose to have the seminal revelation at Sinai in a Parsha that's named for Yitro. So let's just put that a question on the side, but in that, that question was in the back of my mind as well. But I wanted to pick up on, on something, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna read some sentences here from the Torah, and I wanna see if you sense anything, any point of tension between them, okay? That's what we're trying to do. So we're on page, Frank, if you would remind me, please, I'm sorry, page three, 95 in the art scroll? Yeah, uh, uh, the very last word on 395 starts okay. verse 8. Starts chapter 18, verse 8. Um, yeah. And Frank, since you're there already, 
Do you want to either read it from the screen because my translation may not be exactly like the art scrolls, or uh, you want me to read it from the art scroll? Either one's fine, and we'll follow okay. along. We'll recognize the fact that there's going to be little nuances of the difference between the two translations, but let's just try to get the gestalt, the overview of the what these sentences talk about. All right, starting so with verse. We'll pick up the narrative. Yitro arrives in the wilderness. The Jewish people are camped there under the clouds of glory. The manna is falling from heaven. It's an idyllic setting, but the Jewish people are in the middle of no place. Yitro travels out into the wilderness to find the Jewish people. He connects with them. Moshe tells him everything that has transpired. And that's where we're picking up the narrative, please. Moses told his father-in-law everything that Hashem had done to Pharaoh and Egypt for Israel's sake, all the travail that had befallen them on the way, and that Hashem had rescued them. Jethro rejoiced over all the good that Hashem had done for Israel, that he had rescued it from the hand of Egypt. Jethro said, Blessed is Hashem who has rescued you from the hand of Egypt and from the hand of Pharaoh, who has rescued the people from under the hand of Egypt. Now I know that Hashem is greater than all the gods who are in the very manner in which the Egyptians had conspired against them, dot, dot, dot. Right, because in the very matter they had conspired against them, God intervened and rescued them and, and they emerged whole and complete. So he's celebrating the story of events, the narrative of events that Moshe told him about. He didn't see it firsthand, but there was an awareness in the world that the Jewish people had gone forth from Egypt. He got all the details, all the, a picture of it in his mind. And his response was, as it, as it says there in, in, in the sentence, Baruch Hashem, Asher Hitzio Etchem Miad Mitzrayim. Blessed is Hashem who delivered you from the Egyptians. Okay, that's an emotional reaction. Okay, and, and when we talked about being wholehearted, I highlighted the first words of sentence number nine, Vayichad Yisro. Okay, now it's translated and Yitro rejoiced. You see that? But everyone can see that the word Vayichad is related to the word Echad, to be one, to be unified. Anybody want to take a stab at how that relates to the idea of rejoicing? And this is a stretch. It's a, it's a conceptual question. Anybody have an idea of why we translate, and Rashi really does the translating, and Yitro rejoiced over all the kindness, and they used the word vayichad, Yitro. Anybody want to offer an explanation? Give us a thought please. So since the silence is so deafening, <laughs> but I really want to encourage people to be more brave in this class. Um, I liken this to a phrase that the rabbis say that which goes as follows, Ein simcha ki tasvekos. There is no greater joy for a person and resolving uncertainties. And in life in general, you know, if you've ever been through this where you have a very tough decision to make and you really don't know whether to go to the right or to the left, whether it's better to buy Microsoft or to sell Microsoft short or whatever the issue is right in front of you and you're, you're into it and you feel conflicted and you feel concerned. And then when a person just makes a decision and goes forward, that itself brings a sense of relief and, and it's actually described as joy and happiness. And why would that be? Because, I'm sorry, why would that be? And the reason that would be is because when a person's in a sense of conflict or, or feeling disjointed or feeling as though, should I go to the right or should I go to the left? So just think about it, the person has an inner disharmony, an inner fracture is feeling a sense of a lack of wholeheartedness. That's a word I just want to introduce here. Now it's, I'm split. I see good reasons to do A. I see good reasons to do B. I'm emotionally involved. I want to do the right thing. It means a great deal to me. I'm really not sure what, what the right thing to do is so that, that present, presents a sense of distress 
And when that's relieved, so a person feels a sense of joy. Okay, so, so I want to suggest that this idea of a yichad yitro, that yitro rejoiced in the sense that he became captivated. He became enamored. He felt the sense of, wow, the world makes sense to me. And I'm almost making an analogy here, not to the same extent, but an analogy here to the way the Jewish people reacted in last week's Torah reading at the splitting of the sea, where we know there was a sense of Zekeli, this is my God, and I will, I will always do my utmost to connect with God. You know, Hashem Yimloch, God should rule over the world forever, because at this moment, the value of Hashem's input in the world is so clear to me. And as I saw an artistic representation of, but it's mentioned in the rabbis, the whole world split open like the sea did. And that's where the idea is that all the Jewish people became prophets because they had a perception, a clarity of reality, a clarity of their connection to Hashem, which, which, which seized them and galvanized them and made them whole as people. So do you see how I'm suggesting this word vayichad yitro that he rejoiced? It, it, it strikes me as an unusual um, interpretation. There are some comments here. For example, when we're going to see later that Rashi gives a second explanation to the word. And, and the Mizrahi, for example, one of the commentaries actually says that Rashi had to give a second explanation because it should have really said vayismach yitro, that yitro became joyful if that's what the only meaning of the world was, word was. But let's get that straight. That's what the word is. He rejoiced. He felt a sense of harmony in the world, a sense of inner peace, a sense of everything coming together. And now everything makes sense to me. And then, of course, you could say, Baruch Hashem Asher Hitzil Edchem Miyad Mitzrayim. He wasn't saved. He was safely in the peanut gallery together with Moshe's wife and Moshe's children. But he could feel a sense of tremendous thanksgiving and blessing and goodness, complete, completely within it, filling himself up out of the response to what he what Moshe explained to him had happened. Now. Let's look at Exodus 22. And Frank, again, please intervene here. What page is that on in the art scroll? This is the first of the Ten Commandments. 407. Page 407. It's chapter 20, sentence 2. I think this is something that most people are very familiar with. Anochi Hashem Elokecha Asher Hotseiticha Mi Eretz Mitzrayim Mi Beit Avadim. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. Okay, so here God is in initiating communication with the entire Jewish people. This is the revelation at Sinai. And by the way, I always have to mention this, that no other religion in the world claims that revelation happened to everyone. Judaism is the only religion that is predicated on the notion that, that there was revelation to everyone. And we know what we're familiar enough with other religions to realize it happens to one group of people, to an individual person, whatever the story is. But the Jewish people have as its founding principle revelation to the entire people at one time, which of course is somewhat confirming, because how do you can how do you tell? a nation of 3 million people, you just saw something. And we're writing down in the annals of history, this just happened. Whenever we say, well, I, did it happen? I, I didn't see that happen. Um, so that's a verification of the Torah. How do I always understand that? The famous question on Exodus 22 is, why didn't God say, I am the Lord your God who created heaven and earth? Doesn't that give God a bigger more awe-inspiring stature than the fact that God rescued us from Egypt. Does anybody have an answer that they've heard to that question? Why the Ten Commandments began, I am the Lord your God, 
who brought you out of Egypt, the house of bondage, instead of saying, I am the Lord, your God, who created heaven and earth. Anybody heard an explanation to that that they want I to think, make? I think I may have heard two explanations. Okay. One is uh, there's certainly a greater sense of immediacy as to having been brought out from the land of Egypt. Um, uh, it's well within the, the uh, short-term memories of everyone who was there. Right. Um, and uh, the other reason that I heard is that it shows that God is continually involved in what happens on earth. He didn't just get involved at the creation and then go uh, um, sit aside and, and watch what happens. Right. So, so an important way, in other words, it's, it's refuting a notion of God that someone could have, which would be more limited, which is a notion of God of, yes, God created heaven and earth. What a majestic creation. And whatever my theory is, the Big Bang theory, this theory, that theory doesn't really matter. Because what I know is there had to be an initiator, and God initiated everything. He set the world in motion. He created the initial matter that blew up in the Big Bang Theory, or he put the initial energy into the world. However you want to conceive that, or if you want to take a more simplistic approach that God just created, um, you know, however you want to understand it. But then you could end up thinking, okay, but I'm not going to pray to God, or I'm not going to eat the kind of food that God says I should eat, because God, you know, he did that, you know, thank you, you know, thank you for helping out the universe a couple of billion years ago, or if I want to be really from 5,782 years ago, thank you, thank you, thank you, now go back to your ivory tower, and you have your angels, and do, keep busy with whatever you do, and give me the freedom to be a human being, and I'm going to do what I want to do, so in a certain sense, the second idea, which, which is a fundamental idea, is that had God said, I am the Lord, your God, who created heaven and earth, we might have said, that's great. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Now, um, leave us alone, and we're going to go through history like all the other peoples of the world do without feeling a sense of responsibility or obligation or a sense of interaction on a continuous basis with God, which are all things that the Torah recommends. Okay, so that's the way I always understood it. So in other words, God... There's a revelation at Sinai, God speaks, and God says, I am the Lord your God. Now, nobody has to prove that God exists at that point, because if I'm sitting here talking to you, okay, we're, we're talking all through computers, so maybe I am, you know, I forget, what, what do they call it, an avatar, <laughs> and I don't really exist. But um, if we were sitting at the same table together, which is something hopefully we'll do again soon, and we're talking to each other, I don't have to justify that I exist, but I may want to justify my relevance and my connection and my interest in you and the fact that I, I am part of your life and all that's what the Torah is refuting. So I want to show you attention in my mind. And the question will be, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? In the story of Yitro, which begins this week's Torah reading, we get Moshe telling Yitro the story, the events, the testimony of the Jewish people going out of Egypt. And in response to that, we get Yitro saying, Baruch Hashem asher hates you, Abraham. Blessed is the Lord who delivered you from Egypt and from Pharaoh, right? So we know what comes first and what comes second. God intervened in the world. He rescued the Jewish people. He, there was justice in what God did in the world. And, and, and the story is told to Yitro, and his response is, wow, I'm going to rejoice in God and God's relationship in the world, and I'm going to say a bracha out loud because I'm all in, and that's the way I respond to the story. And yet, if you look at the Ten Commandments, it seems to be saying, I'm the Lord, your God. And I'm the one who took you out of Egypt. So do you see how, which idea is seminal? Which idea should come first? And, and really what's included in this question is, how do you and I go about deepening our connection with God, making our connection more complete, wholehearted, that it should 
it should envelop us that when somebody says, how are you doing? And I say, Baruch Hashem. And I'm thinking to myself, well, things could be a lot better or whatever I'm thinking. Instead, to grow in my relationship with Hashem so that when I say Baruch Hashem, it's really, I'm captivated with a wholehearted, permeating sense that Yitro has in, in saying those words, Baruch Hashem. So does anybody, do you see the tension? Does anybody want to try to off, offer a solution to this? Again, don't all shout out at once. Do people hear that there's a question or a tension between the two? Because what I saw quoted recently, and I did look up the source, the source is not perfectly clear to me, but it was quoted by a very um, trustworthy authority, that the Rosh, one of the early sages, the Rishonim of the Jewish people writes, that when you read the Ten Commandments, says, Anochi Hashem al am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt, out of a house of slavery. It's the second part of the sentence that you have to really focus on. And by doing so, the first part of the sentence becomes clear to you. You hear what I'm saying? I want to make a clarification here. So when God said, I am the Lord your God, and again, God at that moment is talking to every individual Jewish person. And we have the Jewish tradition that all of the souls of all of the future Jewish people were gathered at Sinai. So therefore, you and I also heard God speak to us. But the key here, according to the Rosh, is not that, oh, there's a God. But the key here is, wow, God took us out of the land of Egypt, out of a, a Beit of Adim, out of a house of bondage. Wow, look what God has done for me. Look how God has put out for me. Look at the depth of God's concern, love for me, involvement with my life, giving, being part of my creation and being a partner with my mother and father in my very creation and the, in the initiation of me as a physical human being by injecting the neshama, the soul from on high. So the rush says, the rush flips in a certain sense, the first of the Ten Commandments. And God is almost saying, I'm speaking to you. I want you to know, not that I exist, which is included in the first of the Ten Commandments, but I want you to know how I've intervened in history. And it's not just the abstract idea that I'm not an old God sleeping up in the heavens, busy with my own, managing my own portfolio, but rather I am the, the being, I am, the, I am God, who did kindness and miracle and turned heaven and earth upside down all on your behalf to bring you to this moment in time so that we could have a wholehearted, complete, intense, fulfilling relationship with one another. Okay, that's the, the idea I wanted to, that's the framework of this class and I wanna to try to develop it a little bit, but, um, is there any questions on this? Do people hear what I'm saying? Words, I'm suggesting here that the real essence of, of putting this, um, putting the Ten Commandments in the context of Yitro joining the Jewish people sheds an eye-opening light on the Ten Commandments and says that our whole focus has to be on reflecting on the past and continuing and please God, future relationship we have with God, God's involvement in my life and in the life of my family and in the guidance of the Jewish people and in overall the direction of history. And that becomes the spark and the starting point and the foundation for my relationship with Hashem. And included in that, as um, a son-in-law of mine pointed out to me, is that I have importance. God did this for me, now, not for me to the exclusion of you, but for me and our people, just as Yitro explained, just as Yitro expressed himself, 
So Yitro's introduction to the Jewish people at the beginning of this parsha sheds important light on how we are to use the revelation at Sinai and the Ten Commandments to develop ourselves and to and to deepen our relationship with Hashem and to give us the opportunity to have a wholehearted, complete, satisfying, rejoicing relationship with Hashem. That's the, the, the main point of this class. And I want to um, look at something which you may find to be somewhat of a contradiction to this, but um, I want to explain it anyway, because I think it's an important idea. And one second, I just... So, uh, Rabbi, I, I do have a quick question. It's a little bit tangential to uh, the direction you're taking, but it, it it is on that verse that we just looked at. Yeah. I, I don't understand why it would not have given a greater sense of the unity of Hashem to break that sentence into two parts. I am Hashem, your God. I took you out from the land of Egypt. Because by saying, I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt, it almost seems to be putting a qualification on the first part of the sentence. Right. And, and I think that supports the thesis I'm trying to I'm trying to put forward. There's God's not saying two things here. I want you to believe I exist, and I want you to understand I'm the one who took you out of Egypt. What the Rush in his commentary is saying is I want you to know me as the one who took you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Who am I? I'm God. You know, so that but you see it, it becomes that's why it's a unifying idea. As if God were to say, knock on your front door, and you'd say, hello, who's there? And God were to say, well, the, the, the being who created heaven and earth. Oh, okay. I open the door. Oh, who are you? I'm God. You see what I'm saying? That would be, Anochi Hashem Ha'okecha, Anochi Hotzei Ticho Mi'eretz Mitzrayim Mi'beit Avodim. But the Torah purposefully and significantly says it doesn't work that way. It's a knock at the door. Who's there? Were you taken out of Egypt? Were you freed from bondage? It is I, God, who did that, who's knocking at your door, who's open to a relationship with you, who's looking for a connection with you. And, 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 and that's why the Ten Commandments contain and are the shell of all 613 of the mitzvah, because it's that enveloping and that comprehensive. Okay. Now, I just want to show you a Rashi here, which could you could easily say is counter to what I'm saying, but then I want to discuss it with you. If you look back on the sheet here, I have right on the sheet where it's highlighted here, and I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Rashi explains 1819 in the word Vayichad Yitro, rejoiced. This is the literal meaning. And then, as I mentioned before, commentaries say, but because the Torah didn't use the word Vayismach Yitro, Rashi also brings a Midrash comment. And I think this Midrash comment is very, also very enlightening. The Midrash comment is, his flesh became prickly, which is the word Chidudim. And that's why the word vayichad is, it crept with horror. He felt grieved at the destruction of Egypt. That is what the common proverb says, that a proselyte, a gear, a convert to Judaism, even though his heathen descent dates far back as 10 generations, meaning his family converted to Judaism 10 generations ago, you still don't speak disparagingly of an, any other non-Jew in his presence, and that's a Gemara in 94a. And the Gemara derives that from this nuance in the Torah. Now, let's look at this, and, and I want to I put this in the right context. We've been discussing Yitro joining the Jewish people and becoming so moved by the narrative that Moshe tells him that he, in a wholehearted way, says, Baruch Hashem. However, this nuance in the Torah says at the same time 
he felt a continuing affinity, that's the way I understand the Rashi, I'm not sure everybody does, that's right, to the poor Egyptians who had been destroyed. And we have our concerns for the Egyptians too. We don't rejoice over the fact that thousands of Egyptians died in the context of her going out. Because we have a sentence in Proverbs that, in, in Tehillim that says, when your enemy falls, don't rejoice. So we're not rejoicing over their loss. We are rejoicing over the fact that God interceded to rescue us. However, we don't feel that con conflicting affinity to the Egyptian people as Paro did. And then in, in and the way I would put read it in current terms, he had an involuntary response of his skin is prickling up. And the analogy that's used when you talk to these um, evolutionary biologists, and they, they give the example of a cat. When a cat is confronted by danger, its hair stands on end. And we know we, we, we sometimes do that with people and sometimes you feel it on the back of your neck. These are visceral responses that, that, that go to the depth of one's automatic response. It's like something, it's not, you're not thinking about it, but that's the way your emotions react. So I want to stop for a moment and point something out here. We can learn from Yitro the proper perspective on the first of the Ten Commandments. We can also, without denigrating Yitro, understand that there was a limitation to the wholeheartedness, not because he had reservations, not because he was confused, not because he was hedging his bets, not because he felt like I hope there'll be a few minutes when God's not looking and I can have a shrimp salad because I really love shrimp salad. And I know that that's prescribed by the Torah. He didn't have those kind of conflicts, but he had built in with that same heart an affinity of saying, well, the Egyptians are also my people. Because after all, I may join the Jewish people, which he hadn't done yet. He does it right then and there. And therefore, I still feel that tug, or as the Talmud teaches us in Sanhedrin, even for generations and generations, there's something in my makeup which is conflicted and which feels an allegiance. Now, so I want to show you something about being wholehearted. It wasn't because he was ambivalent. It wasn't because he was inside, in any level, a denier. It's because at his fundamental core, he still had a connection to those poor Egyptians who were drowned at the sea and who lost their firstborn children and who suffered during the time of the 10 plagues. Not that it confused him that God wasn't fully just, he understood God was fully just. Not that he lost his enthusiasm for the amazing miracles that he could celebrate, but that narrative, that inner narrative of connection to the peoples of the world that were so built into Yitro did create an element of duality, an element of conflict. And hence what Rashi is saying in a very esoteric way is that his, the, 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 his skin became prickly. He had a visceral, emotional reaction within himself which said, well, you know, boy, there was a lot of suffering there. And those really are my people also. And, and I can't help but feel that reaction at the same time. And hence the Torah is painting a picture that it means both, it's not, it doesn't mean one or the other. It means he truly rejoiced, but at the same time he rejoiced. And that's what Chaim Shmulevitz holds, that Rashi is not giving us two contradictory definitions. He's giving us the definition that, yes, he rejoiced, and he rejoiced in a very wholesome way, but it wasn't complete based on his background and based on the, the sense of nar inner narrative, and that's my word that I'm using here, that he carried within himself. And this is where I wanted to take another look at a couple of sources here, which have to do with this idea of being wholehearted. And I just want to go through the, the, the source sheet here for just a minute. We say in the morning prayers, before we say the Shema, and after all, in the Shema, we say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echod. 
There's a oneness to God. There's a unity to God. And then we say, you should love the Lord your God with your whole heart. Rashi points out is in the plural. We won't discuss that nuance right here. But clearly the goal of practicing Judaism and the goal of living a meaningful life is to develop an ever more wholehearted, complete, unambiguous relationship with Hashem. And, you know, on a romantic level, you say that's the goal of marriage. The goal of marriage is for two people to devote themselves to building a family, to, to, to ultimate kindness, respect, regard for one another. And over time, that becomes a more and more wholehearted relationship so that when a person who has <clears throat> an advanced marriage, I'll just use that, it could be over time, could be because of the experiences that he and his spouse have gone through, she and his spouse. But when a person brings home flowers and says to his wife, here, these flowers are for you and I love you, that, that's a more deeply held, more wholehearted, it more represents the totality of the person. So when we pray in the morning, before we get to the Shema, we say, we ask Hashem to please unify our hearts to love and fear your name. And you see that word, Vayichad, I really should have highlighted it, but that's the word we're counting over and over again, that God should, should unify our hearts. Now, what does that mean? So I, I listed here two explanations that I found. Explanation number one, these are not contradictory. Our request is that Hashem help us become single-hearted and undivided in our love and reverence of God's name, keep us from distraction of personal thoughts and selfish motives. So again, to get back to the shrimp salad for a second. In other words, if I'm sitting here and saying, I'm about to say the Shema, and darn, I wish the Torah made provision that once a year at least, I could sit down and enjoy a shrimp salad because that's something that I have a passionate attachment to. But I can't. So therefore, I feel a sense of conflict. So as I approach saying the Shema, I literally call out to God and I say, help me become single-hearted. Help me to become undivided in my love and reverence for fulfilling your Torah. Help me overcome the distraction of personal thoughts and selfish motives. That's one explanation. Another explanation, they're really in line with one another. This is from the Art Scroll Center on page 89. Man's likes and needs propel him in many directions. We ask Hashem to unify our emotions and wishes to serve him in love and fear. So we're, we're really praying for the sense of wholeheartedness because it's difficult to achieve. It's difficult to achieve on one level because we have conflicts and we feel ambiguity. And on a deeper, deeper level, I wanna suggest here, and just wanna connect the class, is because we, the narrative of seeing the exodus from Egypt and seeing God intervene in our behalf and, and, and depicting and emotionally imbibing the idea that God took me out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. I haven't gotten there yet. And I'm working on that. And that's part of the reason why I'm praying in the morning. So I, I have this call. Please, God, help me have this yached levavi. Let me unify my heart. Help us all to unify our hearts. Help us shed whatever reservations, conflicts, and lack of acceptance of the narrative of Jewish life. And what's the narrative of Jewish life? I sure hope say, Ticha mi Eretz Mitzrayim. I owe everything to God. I owe my life. I owe my wealth. I owe my capabilities. Every, I owe the fact that I have the marriage that I have and I have the children that I have and whatever else I have, it all derives from Hashem intervening throughout Jewish history time and time and time again. And that's the God that I'm ready to address when I'm gonna cover my eyes. I'm gonna say, Shema Yisrael, hear O Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. There's one 
God who is who is the, the God over me, to use that translation I once explained. And hence there's a quote here, and, and this is fully discussed in a, in a piece by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs from three or four years ago. He says, to remember is to make a narrative my story, to internalize it. And then the Mishnah and Pesachim says that the goal of the Seder night, each person must see themselves as if they personally were redeemed from Egypt. So I just want to reflect on this for a moment. You know, we live at a time in life where every narrative is in dispute and is under attack. And I remember the headline in the LA Times, and I can't put my finger on when, but it was probably 15, 18 years ago, front page of the LA Times, quoted a certain rabbi, a very prominent rabbi in LA, saying, Rabbi so-and-so, does not believe in the Exodus story. That was the headline, it wasn't across the banner headline of the paper, the front page article. Probably could Google it and retrieve it. Um, so what does all that mean? It means because we live at a time where people are shedding meaning and they're shedding connection and they're, and they're shedding the whole, cent the whole notion that there is a God and that there's a God-centered reality and that relationship with God is significant. So where do we see this unravel? We see it unravel by putting the narratives under attack. And I just, I wanna use a secular example and not because I equate it with the Torah at all, but I grew up stories about Abraham Lincoln, stories about Thomas Jefferson visiting Monticello which I did several times when I was a young person, and seeing his writings and standing by the desk that he wrote at and thinking, wow, he wrote the words, we the people here. And those things were uplifting and inspiring and captivating to me. And I can't help but feel that no kid today has that luxury because you can't even mention any of these people's names without the first thought in the common vernacular, oh, he was a bum. Oh, if he was alive today, we would hang him. Of course, we're not going to do anything that violent. But in other words, he, he would be, you know, he's not, nobody is the person you think they are or think they were. This is the attack of our time. And I guess what looking at this week's Torah reading and thinking about these sources makes clear to me that if you want to undo a society's moorings, and if you want to decouple yourself from an active, vibrant, meaningful relationship with God, just attack the narratives, just cast doubt on them, just, you know, just put in front of you, do you still believe in that? Do you think that really happened? Are you kidding me? In this day and age, in 2022, you really think the sea split, you know? Um, you really think that that the blood turned that the water turned to blood? You really even think the Jews were in Egypt? You really think that King David ever existed? I mean, that was the narrative when I went to Israel originally, over and over again. Every archaeologist, well, this one proved this, and David never was in Jerusalem, and this, and then lo and behold, in in front of our own eyes, the confirmations come up every day. Now, I've discussed in this class; they find literally the seal of the scribe mentioned in the book of Kings, they find it when they excavate the city of David in Jerusalem, okay? But we need these confirmations because we need to shore up our sense of seeing a narrative, knowing a story, that when God knocks on our door or when we knock on his door or whatever the case may be, we have a sense who are you praying to? Who am I praying to? Do you know what God has done for me? How involved in my life he's been? How involved he's been in the lives of every Jewish person from the time of Abraham onward? Do you know how he's how God has put out for us? Do you know how God has sustained us? I mean, and the greatest thing is the world keep wondering, well, what with these Jews? You know, and what's so unbelievable about Jerusalem today? is because it's tangible 
physical confirmation of these prophecies that the world has been deriding for the last 200 years and making fun of. You know, are you, and, and you, all you have to do is look at the writings of Jews circa 1900, where, where prominent Jewish thinkers, when, when they were asked about Jerusalem and the formation of Zionism, they said, Jerusalem's a city for a bunch of old pious Jews to go to so they can die and be buried where they think it's important to be buried. It was total derision. Nobody ever imagined landing, landing in Israel and seeing those skyscrapers and reading about the biotech in industry or coming to Jerusalem and seeing it spread in every direction, grow exponentially over time. Um, when I was a student in Jerusalem, when I got there in 1968, there were three traffic lights in the whole city. And, and, and the, the old time Israelis would stand on the corner just to watch the light go red and green because they were still miffed by the idea that there could be like, like, like there was a need for such a thing in their city, you know? So we just see these things unfolding. To what extent do we wrap our minds around the story? To what extent do we learn from Yitro that when we, when we look at these stories, when we're told about these stories, when we think about our own lives, that we say, ah, somebody says, who's God, who's God? I'm here today. I'm living this life. It's all deriving from God's intervention around me, from his reshaping of my, my reality, from the time that God spoke to Abraham and said, Lechacha, go, travel, get moving. This is not the place I want you to be. And that God continues, not so overtly, but continues to speak to us, continues to push a course of history, which is very clearly, ultimately heading in the right direction. And for us not to be inspired by it is to fall victim to the darkness and negativity and cynicism, which is so prevalent in the time in which we live. And certainly when we want to teach our children and we want to offer them guidance, we have to have this as our bedrock. And when we want to grow ourselves, when we feel down on ourselves because, well, you know, I'm not the Jew I was hoping or thought I might be at this time. So, okay, you want to get to the next level? Dig into the narrative picture better for yourself the stories. Think about Yitro traveling out to the wilderness and how he, even though he realized that his body and soul derived from the nations of the world, and even though he could never shed that ultimate sense of duality, but he could wrap himself around the story that Moshe explained to him that happened and say, Baruch Hashem. And we need to learn to say Baruch Hashem the same way. And that's why I think this ties together the fact that the Ten Commandments need to be contained within the Parsha, which introduces us to the story of Yitro joining the Jewish people. Those are the eyes with which we, are, we want to see the Torah. Those are the eyes in which we want to think about Revelation. And those are the eyes we want to see the unfolding events of our own lives. Happy to answer any questions.